Perfect. So that means we get started, yeah, when I say yes? We, we get started. We are already recording. So if you allow me, uh, just a few words presentation for you. We have Mr. Alexander Malaket from Toronto, Canada. And it's my great pleasure to launch the new year 2022 with him. It's an honor for me to have him in here. And we're going to start with, uh, with a topic that I feel very close to myself and to my interest, which is ESG and sustainability. So, Alexander, I leave it down to you directly to, to get the speech started, to show the slides. It's up to you. And thanks for accepting my invitation. We Wonderful, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. I really appreciate it. It's a great pleasure to be here with you and everybody who's been able to join us. Subra, thank you for, for joining as well. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, it's, it's a pleasure and a privilege here. I'm delighted to join you all for this conversation. And like Andrea, ESG has become uh, an area that I'm not only hugely interested in over the last number of years in particular, uh, but actually, we have a, a new firm that we've established out of London with three other partners where we do ESG-related and sustainability-related advisory work. So it's become part of the daily reality is what I'm getting at here. Um, you know, I've, I've been in the, the international trade space probably for going on to 30 years and most of that in a consulting capacity with, with some significant focus on the trade finance side of the equation, um, including the last, whatever it is now, 22 years as a private consultant and doing a decent amount of industry advocacy work with a number of industry bodies. Um, so hopefully, you know, the three, sort of, well, two of the three topics that we're going to be touching on over the next hour, which is the whole trade and supply chain, the finance and the ESG space, all of those I should be able to speak to with some reasonable, um, let's say, awareness of what's going on. Um, on the DLT and Hyperledger side, I'm going to ask Andrea to help me out at the end of the session so that he and I can sort of uh, play tennis a little bit back and forth with that element of the discussion. So with that uh, context, allow me to then um, just introduce the talk, which is to say that we agreed, Andrea and I, that we would try to connect the dots between trade, supply chains, ELT, ELT or ESG, ESG, pardon me, and DLT. And so we'll, we'll take that as the overarching approach. And what I thought I would do today is to say to you that, that I'll, I'll share with you the conclusion of the talk at the beginning so that we all know where we're going. Um, so from my perspective, trade-related trade financing, which for me is the traditional trade finance plus the supply chain finance components, together with sustainability and ESG are inextricably, inextricably linked. They're completely connected. And what I'm finding is that the linkages are getting more and more serious and more and more significant. Um, I do believe that the enabling underlying architectures and technologies will be critical. And the question I have in my mind is how central a role will blockchain play in that role and in that architecture? And, and then we can talk specifically about Hyperledger and, and where that fits into the equation as well. If it's useful, and I know this is a, a very advanced audience, so I won't spend a lot of time on the contextual pieces, but just to try to frame things maybe with a slightly different lens, I just want to share with you a couple of observations on where we are with international trade. And those of you that are in the trade finance space know this quite well. Um, others maybe a bit less, but the, the World Trade Organization and other entities will say to you that 80% of global trade flows, particularly merchandise trade flows, depend on some form of trade financing. And that includes both the financing you know, in, in the strict definition, but also the risk mitigation piece of what trade finance does. So you know, we're looking at 20 to 25 trillion in trade if you include services. And 80% of that, again, somehow depends on some kind of trade financing capability. Um, we know that uh, trade growth historically outpaced global GDP growth until the global financial crisis of 2008, and then it kind of reversed. We had seen trends pre-COVID of the trade growth and the export growth in particular uh, taking its place again as, a, as an engine of economic growth. Now we're seeing obviously some, some adverse impacts from COVID uh, as well on this level, including on impacting SME suppliers in global supply chains. Um, now, I'll recognize up front, and as we should, that international trade is imperfect. So there are issues about you know, equitable distribution of wealth. There are issues about reaching SMEs and, and micro enterprises in emerging and developing markets. 
There are certainly concerns and issues about the carbon footprint of trade, particularly the shipping industry. Um, and there are a whole slew of geopolitical concerns around how trade works and how the, the architecture for trade is, is built today, including some challenges at the WTO in terms of equitable representation um, and all those sorts of things. But even with all those imperfections, we have to acknowledge that trade has been extremely valuable to the human experience. It's you know pulled pre-COVID 400 million people above the poverty line, and it's just generated significant um, you know, economic value and growth and potential and, and, and improved standards of living around the world. So just that backdrop, I think, is to, you know, the point is to set the stage for me about how important uh, a role trade plays in, in, our, in our collective experience. Um, some, and particularly we saw this in, in a couple of jurisdictions over the last few years, some still see trade as a zero sum, you win and I lose game. Um, others, you know, see it as a, a geopolitical and or other weapon, uh, which I believe is extremely short sighted and extremely um, not only self serving, but also not sustainable, if, I, if you'll permit me that turn of phrase. Um, and actually, I, I'm from the camp that believes that when we trade, we all do better, um, that trade contributes to international security in addition to all the economic benefits. And so when we think about trade, we should be thinking about it strategically and thinking about it holistically in terms of the global community. So that's my that's my sort of soft side coming out. But I do generally genuinely believe that trade uh, has the potential to do tremendous good, has done. And if we manage it carefully and thoughtfully, we can continue to do that. Um, the geopolitics of trade are extremely critical, as we saw, and we're seeing it now with US-China and, and a number of other sort of dynamics. Um, and we're, you know, there's a lot of discussion about reshoring and, and onshoring and friendshoring. Now, this is a new term I've seen recently. Um, but I also want to point out that the economics are the economics. So as much as it may be attractive from a political perspective to talk about certain things, there are economic practicalities, there are economic realities, and as a, as a respected colleague said on a panel last year sometime, it's not that easy to reshore a semiconductor plant, you know, billion dollar operation just because you decide you feel like it or because you need to pander to local political um, priorities. Um, so there are realities to, to think about, and I, I really like the distinction of saying it's not deglobalization, but it's re-globalization. And I credit that remark to uh, Bob Koopman, who's the chief economist at the WTO, who joined us on a panel last year and made the case uh, very compellingly for me that that, in fact, is what we're looking at. So all that to say that um, trade is, is critical uh, on a number of levels. And, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at, from a financing perspective, techniques that are very, very well established on the cl classical trade side, and certainly growing very quickly on the supply chain side, uh, particularly payables finance uh, structures and techniques. Um, so there's, there's a real um, sort of growth dimension or, 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 or tendency in the trade space when you look at it long term. Um, including on the financing side. And we'll, we'll see that the same is, is true now in the ESG sustainability space as well. What I'd like to do is put, uh, put, put to you this notion of um, integrative trade, which I know was written about very significantly by the former governor of the, the Bank of Canada, who also was the chief executive of our National Export Credit Agency, uh, Stephen Polos. Um, Stephen has written extensively about this notion of integrative trade that links international trade and supply chains to things like foreign direct investment flows. So the point here is to say that when we talk about trade, we're not talking about trade in isolation, but we're talking about it in a broader context, which includes, you know, trillions in foreign direct investment flows that are linked to trade activity and vice versa. So you either establish an operation and you trade or you trade and then you establish an operation that leads to, to investment flows. And that also ties into the onshore, like onshoring, reshoring conversation. So, so all of those things uh, link to supply chain structures, which is also a very timely topic with COVID and with the geopolitics that we're looking at today. Um, now, just again to highlight how difficult or complex these supply chains can be, particularly when you look at them in that wider context, you can imagine, you know, a large buyer at one end of the supply chain with multiple thousands of suppliers around the globe. And you can imagine just graphically how complicated the transaction flows are on the fiscal supply chain, as well as on the financial supply chain, and now increasingly in what we call the data supply chain as well. 
Um, and that's where the technical architecture discussion can become very relevant. And that's also where we can tie in some very significant ESG and sustainability observations. So just to keep in mind, physical, financial, and data supply chain as we go through this discussion as well. Um, a couple of quick, um, let's say, highlights of things that are happening in the trade world. So we're all very conscious of 3D printing and additive manufacturing and the impact that that will have over the coming decades. Uh, when you find that General Electric is 3D printing um, components of aircraft engines, it starts to become really interesting. And when you find that, um, you know, there are people talking about people like Kate Raworth in the UK talking about donut economics and saying economics needs to be looked at in a completely different context with things like what's the upper limit of what we can do, given that we live on Earth and the Earth itself has its constraints. Um, and so, you know, what, 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 what can we do? Where are the limits? Where does it start to get dangerous? And then the whole sustainability conversation comes into this as well. Now, we also, post-COVID, have put a lot of attention on the digitization discussion, which by some estimates has been accelerated by at least five years, certainly in trade finance. And now we're seeing more and more momentum in trade digitization as well. And we've had some really good progress in part, uh, thanks to Chris Southworth at ICC UK with Meliter and, and the pickup in digitizing uh, trade finance documentation and related activities. So we're seeing some really good progress there on things that we, you know, a couple of years ago would have said were nearly impossible. Suddenly we're figuring out how to get them done. So there's some really positive developments there. And certainly we're seeing a pickup as well in terms of uh, online trading platforms. And it happens, I put eBay on this slide, it could have been Alibaba and any number of others, Etsy or whatever. Uh, but we're certainly seeing some significant um, developments and evolutions and, and critical masses of volume in those contexts as well. And then finally on this slide, just to, to um, note the work of the Cambridge Institute for Sustainable Leadership, Sustainability Leadership uh, at the University of Cambridge and a lot of the interesting things they're doing in trade including trade finance and sustainability. So um, there's a real, as I said, interlinkage between the three topics and the tech that we're exploring today. Just very quickly, it was interesting to note that Walmart is thinking about these um, blimp-like floating warehouses. Uh, so you can imagine those things being deployed in a number of places and then having drones deliver from one blimp warehouse to another or maybe to the end client. Um, so all that, again, to say that there are some very interesting changes coming on the physical supply chain side of things. On financing, you know, we talked about the 80% figure, and we uh, know that that's, you know, 16 to $20 trillion of trade that's, that's being financed in some way. Um, we, pre-2008, I think it's fair to say that very relatively few beyond core practitioners really knew the role of trade finance. And then Pascal Lamy in the WTO and our, our good friend Marco Boyan at the WTO really worked to bring into focus the role of trade finance in supporting international trade flows. And Stephen Beck at the Asian Development Bank and others also drove that conversation very significantly back then um, through collecting data and through uh, doing analytics and through creating a robust, um, let's say, reports and, and academically solid sort of pieces of analysis that have really brought into focus the role of financing in the support of international trade. Uh, we know the challenges that SMEs face in accessing finance, including trade finance, and that is a perennial challenge, uh, although, again, we're seeing some focus there. Um, the COVID crisis has uh, complicated the finance uh, challenge. You know, we have a, a global trade finance gap that's gone from 1.5 trillion to 1.7 trillion, according to the ADB's latest analysis. Uh, and we know that there are some real challenges in terms of being able to fill that gap using traditional mechanisms and traditional providers of trade finance. And if I can put it more bluntly, we know that the banks who are the core providers, certainly of traditional trade finance, will never fill that gap. They just simply don't have balance sheet capacity. They don't have risk tolerance. They have you know, um, cap uh, you know, capital adequacy constraints that are limiting their ability to, to address this. So there's a real drive to try to sort out how we might be able to fill that gap so that we can drive additional trade and then uh, drive additional economic value creation. So in terms of what trade finance is, again, this is a sophisticated audience, but I wanted to share with you my framework for this, and I've used it, I don't know, probably for the last 15 years or so, and it's, it's you know, I've, I've included it in my book on the topic, and so far it has stood the test of time, and it hasn't been broken down. 
Um, and so what I'll say is trade finance, no matter how complicated it is, is a, some combination of one of one or more of four factors. And that is um, secure and timely payment across borders, some form of financing or lending, some form of risk mitigation, and then finally, some related data or information flow. And it doesn't matter how complicated the deal is, how complex the structure is, what markets you're dealing with, um, you will find some combination of those four or a subset of them in any trade financing deal. And therefore, you can understand the deal based on those, those four dimensions. And obviously, you know, when you're, if you're dealing with, say, a relatively high risk market or a new trading relationship, maybe the risk mitigation piece becomes more critical. And the payment piece is maybe a second secondary priority, whatever. So those things will sort of rise and fall depending on, on the circumstances of a particular deal. But that's the framework that, that is helpful to me in understanding what this business is about. In terms of the digitization piece, um, everybody is familiar notionally with the paper flows, but this graphic that was created um, by Boston Consulting Group in 2018 has been extremely useful to me to get a visual of this. Um, you know, 35 to 45 pages of documentation per trade deal, 600 million documents uh, per year, um, you know, 400, 400 to 600 data fields per transaction, um, and, and 4,000 to 6,000 data field interactions, which is about 200 billion per year. And yet we know that there's a huge amount of duplication in all of this. So um, when we talk about the potential for trade finance to be digitized, it's partly addressing this problem and really getting to the core of the really valuable data that's in, in this activity. And in fact, just quickly to mention, um, in the anti-money laundering financial crimes compliance AML CFT space, um, we are doing some work with ADB on, on, on this kind of thing and how we could um, better leverage the data in these transactions to enhance investigations, intelligence gathering, and prosecutions around AML activity, as well as the underlying predicate crimes. So uh, there are a number of applications to these uh, technical evolutions. Um, just quickly on supply chain finance, as I mentioned, that's where the growth is in our business. I mean, traditional trade mechanisms have been trending flat to downward for at least the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, if not longer. Um, and industry data shows that year on year. Um, and so we know that the, the growth is in these supply chain finance techniques. Um, and in 2016, we published with four industry associations, uh, five, pardon me, partnering, partnering on this, these sort of standard definitions, which I commend to you if you've not seen them. Uh, but that's where the growth is in terms of how financing gets done from a trade perspective. Now, just um, to get to the ESG discussion um, relatively um, soon, but I want to spend a bit more time on this piece because I think that's the new element of this, perhaps for this group. Um, and it's, it's to say that I want to put ESG in, in a historical arc for you. So if you go back maybe 30 years or so when the environmental movement started, this was for me the beginning of the kind of thinking that led us to where we are today in terms of ESG. So when Greenpeace was you know, storming ships at sea and, and people were considered to be on the fringe if they were talking about environmental issues. Um, you know, we're at a point now where the environment, as you've seen from COP26 and, and other things happening around us, it is very much at the heart of the discussions that we undertake, even in, in corporate boardrooms. Um, in the ESG space, when you have Larry Fink at BlackRock, who is, you know, the, manages the biggest one of the biggest, if not the biggest investment funds on the planet, and um, you know, championing ESG and championing sustainability, you've, you've got to appreciate how much those fringe, and I put that in quotation marks, conversations have um, come into the, in, into the heart of, of, of discussions, policy discussions, commercial discussions, and other similar uh, conversations. So going from that environmental movement of 30 years ago, we then um, progressed, I guess, to corporate social responsibility. Uh, now, from my perspective and the perspective of my partners in London at ESG Validation, our view is that CSR, in a sense, devolved because it became a bit of a public relations exercise. It became a process by which um, companies engaged in um, you know, charitable works and, and activities of that type. And largely, in our view, again, I'm qualifying this, did this as a public relations exercise. And so, so I think the integrity of CSR um, if, was damaged by that, by that reality and that experience. And so it's one of the things that we're watching very carefully with ESG 
uh, and with you know, so-called greenwashing and so-called virtually virtue signaling activities um, to make sure that that doesn't overtake the fundamentally correct path that ESG is taking us on. Um, if we put this again in, in context, you have the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, um, the 17 of them with their multiple sub goals. Um, they are an outgrowth of the Millennium Devel Development Goals, and it's this attempt to bring together a group of stakeholders to say, what are the big problems we need to solve for the survival of humanity and the planet and for actually better than survival, but actually you know, proper evolution and, and, and having a, a decent quality of life for, for, for the planet and for everything that inhabits it. Um, so the, the SDGs are very, very far reaching, as you can see, and they're very ambitious in terms of how far they reach in defining the sub goals and activities that we hope to, to accomplish underneath that SDGs umbrella. Um, certainly the whole discussion of stakeholder capitalism and the triple bottom line has picked up momentum. So this is the whole question of what's the purpose of a corporation or a business? Is it really all about the Milton Friedman profit maximization discussion or is there something larger than that? And you know, it's coming into this whole discussion of does a business have a social license to operate? And, and if it doesn't, what does that mean? Um, should it be conscious of the social license to, to operate? And should it then have a responsibility that ties back to that? And I think the answer is yes on both points, but I think there are still some debates about how far along we're, we've come and how, how far we're likely to travel down that path. There are still those arguing that actually uh, profit maximization remains the primary motivation and actually the rest of it is is a bit fanciful and, and not, not at all realist, realistic. But um, when you keep in mind that, you know, um, Bloomberg is predicting 53 trillion US dollars in assets under management that will be ESG aligned by 2025, which is now only three years away, uh, that represents about 33% of global assets under management by various uh, investment funds and, and asset managers. So you can see that there's at least, at least the potential for a huge, ESG aligned activity in the capital markets. Um, and that's gonna drive a lot of other activities as it is, or, as it is already doing. Um, so this whole evolution or this arc of history around ESG, I think is, is when, when you connect those dots this way, um, hopefully it becomes clear that actually it is part of a longer term progression. And it's not something that suddenly popped up out of the blue and it's not uh, some theoretical exercise that people have, have come up with maybe on the NGO side or on the academic side, it actually ties very directly to the broader evolution of human society, of, of business, of trade. Um, and we can, we can, we can trace that, that arc of history back at least 34 years, if not before that. Um, and I think that when you track the space and you find that um, boards and C-suite executives are taking very much to heart their obligations in the ESG space and the sustainability space, um, it's no longer an option to have that conversation. It's actually an, an urgent requirement. And I think people are becoming more and more conscious of that reality. Um, it is, however, a nascent space. Now, the 53 trillion that I mentioned a minute ago, I mean, if you pick up, if you run a Google search, which I did just before this presentation, and do an image search on ESG investment, investments or ESG funds, you, this is basically what you find is you find a group of these kind of graphs from multiple sources and they're all hugely trending upwards in terms of ESG or sustainability aligned investment activity. And that's going to translate and fat in fact has um, at, at the broader economic level as well. Now, this is when I say it's a nascent space, you know, I go back to the work that we did in the supply chain finance uh, area in 20, whatever it was 2014 to 2016 where we didn't even speak the same language on supply chain finance as an industry. And I, and I argue we still don't. We still have work to do to get to consistent language and definitions. But ESG is, is even you know, earlier in its journey on this. There are debates now whether we should be talking about environmental, social, and governance issues, ESG, or whether we should be flipping it and saying, actually, it's governance, environmental, and social issues. Because if you get the governance, governance right, then the rest should flow properly. Now, you know, define what right proper governance looks like, and then you, you get into another discussion. But those who argue GES are saying, if you get the governance right at the board level, at the policy level, at the C-suite level, uh, then the rest should flow naturally. 
Now, that assumes that the governance thinking has evolved beyond the pure profit maximization motivation, which it hasn't in all places. So, you know, there's some debate there. Then, then the question starts about, is it really ESG or are ES and G three specific or distinct pillars within, within this construct? And then the question becomes, with climate change, you know, the priority on, on environment is understandable, but if you, if you fix the environment and you don't fix the social inequities, then, you know, you still risk some kind of um, let's say instability, and if I use sort of extreme language, revolution of some type or other, um, because of the inequity, um, can you disregard the governance piece and, and focus on the other two? So there's a real question about whether you break it up into components or not, whether that makes sense or whether you have to take a holistic approach. Then uh, recently, there's even been a suggestion that actually ESG isn't even enough. So we need ESG, and then we need another E, to deal with the economics, because we need to re deal with the reality of the economic impact of the ESG considerations, and we need to deal with the reality of um, what are the economic opportunities that come with the whole ESG construct. So um, when I say it's a nascent space, I mean, even on basic definitions, we haven't yet agreed, uh, and we probably won't for some time, but one thing is, is sure, it's, it's undeniably in a growth mode. Now, just to give you a sense of the scope, this is from the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, which now I think doesn't exist anymore post, post COP26. It's been, it's been integrated with another entity. Um, but, but the SASB's materiality map gives you a good sense of all of the sorts of things that are involved. And certainly when we talk about E for the environment, um, there's a lot of talk about carbon emissions. Uh, but there are a whole range of other issues under that, including things, uh, somewhere in there, I think there should have been biodiversity, because if you, interesting enough, um, if you look at the World Economic Forum risk uh, risk map, biodiversity is likely risk and the highest adverse impact risk. So it's the biggest single risk that the WEF identifies in the risk map is biodiversity loss. So there are some real discussions about how do we manage the whole climate and environmental discussion, but not lose sight of other related issues that might be even more imminent and more urgent, including things like biodiversity loss. Um, on the governance side, look at I mean, you can see things anything ranging from ethical behavior to competitiveness to legal and regulatory issues, um, critical incident risk management. Certainly, that's something that COVID has brought sharply into into focus for us over the last uh, two years, and and and, and then some. Um, and then you know, there's a whole range of other things: social capital issues around human rights, um, data security and privacy, um, product safety, consumer customer or consumer welfare. So this is just to give you a sense of all the sorts of things that could be covered under an ESG discussion. Uh, labor practices, obviously, labor safety, uh, you know, child labor, we, we think about that a lot in, in the context of trade and supply chains, or at least we should. Um, and, then, and then beyond that, um, I can also highlight uh, the sorts of things that, that tie into some very significant risks, right? So if we look at um, the whole 1.5 degree conversation that came out of, or that, that fed into COP26 and actually has been part of the conversation for some time. Um, the, the practical reality, I mean, this is life and death, right? Um, if we get past a certain point of temperature on the earth, and last year apparently was the hottest um, year temperature wise on record uh, in the history of our experience. If we get past a certain point, everything on earth becomes uninsurable. So imagine the implications of that for you, whether it's your home, whether it's your businesses, whether it's you know, your, your business partners, anything that you can imagine where you're trying to mitigate some form of risk, the insurance companies and the, their partners simply will not be able to do this. We've already seen huge um, payouts related to climate disasters and, and, and things like this over the last number of years, and that's become a very significant topic of discussion in insurance circles. Um, but just imagine if you get to a point where absolutely nothing is insurable. And the implications of that are just mind boggling. Um, I mentioned the whole business of biodiversity loss. Um, so it's really climate plus biodiversity. We have some really significant challenges to deal with there. Um, and and you know, some of the initiatives that are being undertaken here are helpful and important, but it just feels like we're not doing enough. Um, now, I don't see any of you on screen, but I'm gonna ask a rhetorical question and I'll assume that your hands will all be up. So, and I'm putting mine up here. So. How many of you buy clothing? How many of you buy food? And how many of you um, own a smartphone? So I'm gonna assume it's yes for all of you. And one of the stunning things that I learned recently, and you can tell by the gray hair here, um, if I were smart, I would be talking about you know, early, early retirement and golfing, but, but I'm, I'm 
I'm not. So for that reason, I'm back in school. Um, one of the things I'm studying is a, is a certificate course in ESG. And in the context of this very, very good course, we had a guest speaker who works in the area of, of human slavery uh, and human trafficking. And if you answered yes to the three questions that I asked you, you are very personally and very directly tied to somewhere between 38 and 40 cases of human slavery in your personal supply chain. So when I heard that data point and the gentleman who spoke to us is an expert in the field and he said, I can't get my number below 38. That's how ingrained human trafficking and human slavery is in our international supply chains. So I, I leave that with you to think about the fact that we're not, this is not a theoretical conversation. When we talk about ESG, we talk about sustainability, we talk about the human impact of these things. It's very, very serious business. Um, and so this is one data point, hopefully, that will bring that, um, bring that point home for you. Now, in terms of the sustainable development goals and the ESG piece, if you're a business or if you're running a business and you get it wrong, there's a huge reputational risk. And increasingly, your clients, your investors, and your other stakeholders want you to get this right. And if you don't, you'll pay for it. So there was a, a significant case in London, I want to say a year and a half, two years ago, where this company had a very, very high rating from one of the ESG ratings uh, entities or agencies. In fact, I think it got their top rating. And then within a number of weeks, it was found that one of their production facilities, about 60 miles outside of London, so we're not talking about some remote corner of the world here, um, that facility was using indentured labor to produce the goods that this company was selling. And so, you know, there's, there's a real risk if you don't get this right. Uh, but there's also a significant opportunity. So there are those who look at this, the 17 SDGs and say, actually, this is the biggest roadmap to opportunity that we've ever seen. Because for companies and businesses and organizations that solve these problems, the upside is tremendous. And so when we look at it from a trade and supply chain perspective, if you address the sustainable development goal, the goal objectives through your supply chains and through trade activity, the upside is, is huge. I mean, when, they, when there was a, a, a business roundtable attempt to calculate the financing of the SDGs originally, this is going back a number of years now, it was estimated to be a three to $5 trillion challenge to, to finance the SDGs holistically and get them all done and delivered. The positive element of that was the ROI was estimated to be 300% if we could get it right. So, and that was a very sort of initial rough estimate, but, but the upside is very significant. Um, now, when I mentioned that we are still looking at definitions and discussions, we're, we're even, even more broadly than just um, ESG, even some of the language that we use in this context needs definition, right? Are we talking about a carbon tax or a carbon price? And I really don't like the carbon tax expression because it's a political expression. It, it is meant to, um, stir up opposition or to, to, to create controversy, when in fact what we're saying is that carbon needs to be priced into the production of goods. We need to take externalities, as, as we, we say in economics, and, and actually price them into the production of the goods that are being created so that you're actually reflecting the appropriate cost of resources and then creating appropriate value related to that production. So it's, it's a pricing exercise, not a taxing exercise or a taxation exercise in my view. And I'm happy to have that discussion. Um, then the other piece that we talk a lot about is how do we deal with this? And let's think about carbon emissions here for a minute. Um, what's the difference in the situation between a developed economy, um, and I'll, you know, I, I don't want to point to anybody in particular, any one of them, versus a, an emerging or developing economy? And the developing economy leaders will say, look, you, you guys have been doing this for the last two or 300 years since the Industrial Revolution and before that, and you, you got us here. And now you're going to tell us that we can't. And that's problematic because carbon emissions for us are part of a, a growth and development process. And it's very difficult for us not to do that. Uh, and it's not like we can go out and buy solar panels tomorrow the way you guys can do it. So there's a huge disconnect between expectations and realities on the ground. And actually, if you're in discussions with emerging market leaders and developing market leaders, they will tell you in some parts of the world, burning coal is a matter of life and death. It's the only source of heat and energy that's available or economically available. And so it's life and death. It's not a matter of, you know, we have a choice and we're just making the wrong choice. Um, it's, it's, it's something that where, where there isn't really optionality. And by the way, you know, I don't have the data point on this, but I suspect if you eliminated all of the carbon emissions uh, of the continent of Africa, you, it, it would be a drop in the bucket compared to if you solved the US or China or, or one of the other sort of large economy 
uh, emissions problem. So there's also this kind of inequity in, in the whole conversation. So for that reason, this notion of a just transition, meaning an equitable and correct transition comes into the ESG discussion. Um, and, and so it should. Um, I just want to highlight again that I'm, I'm conscious that we're coming up on time, so we'll wrap it up shortly, but I want to highlight again in the context of trade and supply chains that we're looking at you know, multiple 10,000 or 20,000 suppliers, whatever, um, and think about the ESG and sustainability discussion in the context of this kind of a supply chain that reaches from, say, you know, Europe all the way through to Africa or South Asia and all of the circumstances of each company and business and community across that supply chain. Um, even with that, what's very clear is that investors and consumers and other stakeholders and now increasingly regulatory authorities are demanding ESG alignment and ESG aligned behavior from supply chains and particularly uh, large buyers at the end of supply chains. So when a large buyer faces that kind of demand, they will naturally drive that requirement down into their supply chains, which will drag SMEs and micro enterprises into the ESG discussion, whether they want to be there or not. Um, and we're in my, my, my partners and I are in discussions with a firm in the UK on this topic to say, how do we make ESG not only relevant for SMEs, but also, let's say, affordable and, and actionable? Uh, and we all know SMEs, they're living you know, from one invoice to another, they're cash poor and resource poor, and they're basically often in, in survival mode. And when you come to them and say, look, you got to be thinking about sustainability, uh, they very often say, well, I'd love to, but I have to pay my bills, right? I have to meet my payroll or I have to pay my utilities or whatever. So it's, it's, a, it's an urgency question. But the minute their buyer uh, says thou shalt, then suddenly it becomes part of that survival equation. And that is what we're seeing happen. Um, and so ESG will be driven down into the SME supplier community. Um, and we're actually seeing that now. So part of the connecting the dots discussion today is to, to realize that supply chain transparency is one of the things that is being increasingly demanded, partly in the ESG context, but now certainly in the COVID context as well. And then related to that, the whole traceability. So if you want, and we tried this maybe 10 or 12 years ago with, with Cambridge um, in terms of uh, palm oil. So the discussion with, with BAFT, uh, the Bankers Association for Finance and Trade, and this was uh, Jeremy Wilson when he was at Barclays was driving this, was can we demonstrate palm oil in Indonesia was sustainably sourced and that it's the same palm oil that was sourced initially that's gone through the supply chain and made it to the endpoint. And if we can show that, and if we can certify that, can the financiers come in and offer some kind of incentive for that sustainable sourcing behavior? So that kind of thinking isn't new, but we're still very much working on it and developing it and evolving it. So the traceability piece ties in very much with the transparency piece. Now, what COVID has brought into focus for us is the resiliency question. And resiliency is a matter of how well and how quickly does a supply chain respond to unexpected shocks? And so that's the other piece that we're, we're observing now. And actually, interestingly enough, at least anecdotally, and there's some data starting to come up on this, that um, companies and businesses that were socially conscious and more ESG aligned and more sustainably structured and, and running more sustainably were found to be actually much more resilient to, to the COVID crisis because they were able to pivot, because they were able to respond appropriately more quickly than others that were not, that were driven purely by, by profit maximization and bottom line. So those companies that reacted to COVID by um, pushing costs into their supply chain or trying to delay payment to their suppliers or otherwise making it somebody else's problem have done far worse than those companies who looked at their businesses and their communities holistically and said, okay, how do we come together to address this crisis and, and how do we come out of it in a, in a, in a healthier, stronger way? So the whole ESG discussion, again, in mid-crisis has proven to be very, very practical and important. Um, clearly, those that are running ESG and sustainability as a tick box or as a PR exercise are on the loser side of the ledger. Um, again, as I mentioned, those that are doing the go it alone, I'll survive and you die and it's not my problem. Um, and those that see them winning in a supply chain means their supplier losing, again, you know, wrong side of the ledger. Um, those that really embrace ESG and demonstrate a commitment and actually can, can, can prove that the commitment has been met or that they're taking legitimate measures to do that, those that are looking at a balance between commercial and sustainable and actually don't see them as being opposing forces. And those that look at this from an ecosystem and community perspective are doing much better than, than their counterparts. 
Um, from an investment perspective, I've been in discussions with, with asset managers and, and pension fund managers who said to me, look, my, my job, my mandate, my, my fiduciary obligation is to maximize returns for my pension plan or whatever investment fund they're managing. So if I have to go and invest in a SIM portfolio, uh, you know, munitions, you know, cigarettes or whatever, uh, and it's not ESG aligned and it's not sustainable, oh, well, too bad. That's, that's, my, that's my responsibility and that's how I execute it. Uh, but I think we're going to find that that argument is going to hold less and less uh, credibility and less and less water as we go. And then finally, again, on the traceability question, there's a very clear pull to traceability and a very clear growing opposition to opaque scenarios in supply chains. Um, we talked briefly about supply, uh, about trade finance and the fact that we don't have capacity in traditional sources to meet the $1.7 trillion trade financing gap. Um, we've been doing some work, and again, it's a multi-year kind of effort, and we're trying to, to kick it off again with, with our friends uh, at, at ITFA, with, with Sean Edwards and, and Srats and Gupta and the team, to try to develop trade finance as an investable asset class. Uh, and part of my connecting the dots here is to say that trade finance, actually, because it finances real economy activity, and to the extent that we are advancing the just transition and sustainable sourcing and all those sorts of things, that we talked about so far in the context of supply chains, we then become a very attractive ESG line investment opportunity. And so if we can connect the dots between trying to develop more capacity to finance trade and making trade finance assets more ESG aligned and more sustainable, we might be able to motivate more capital to come into the asset class. And we know that at the moment, the global capital markets are flush with cash. People are looking for deals, people are looking for returns and they're looking for ESG attractive investment alternatives. And I think I'd like to suggest to you that trade finance is one of those attractive alternatives if we can um, tell the story appropriately and, and create the circumstances uh, in terms of the asset class being comparable and competitive to other alternatives. And one thing that's clear in the ESG and sustainability space, including the UN SDGs, is that you know public capital, meaning in government sources, uh, will not do it alone. Uh, that private capital must be mobilized in connection with it. So get this so-called blended capital uh, dynamic at work. And actually trade finance, again, because of the nature of what it finances, uh, can be very attractive in that respect. Uh, a whole range of scales, systems, and tools uh, for this around sustainability and ESG. Uh, so whether you look at the TCFD materiality framework, whether you look at the International Trade Center's standards map, or any number of other initiatives in the market today, uh, those tools are available. Um, the... Discussion around ESG has to be a serious one. This is taken from our ESG validation white paper that we published, I think it was early 2020. Um, it's, not a, it's not a luxury or distraction. It is a substantive, important consideration. And the question is, you know, where do you want your company's reputation and performance to be when, when, when this gets looked at from a historical perspective? What side of history do you want to be on? Um, on the Hyperledger piece, and Andre and I had a brief discussion before I agreed to do this, and I said, look, I'm not versed enough in Hyperledger and the specifics of Hyperledger. So, Andre, I'm going to suggest, if you don't mind, that you pop yourself on screen and you, you and I can just chat about how we connect the dots here. Because for me, and I'll, and I'll just say that um, I have a, a certain perspective on this. In, in a past life, I managed technology implementations, and I worked very closely with technical people. Um, I'm not a developer, and so I don't get fired up by the sexiest technology. And, and you know that's good or bad. I'm not I'm not saying it's it's good or bad either way, but that's what it is. Um, technology for me is an enabler and a provider, of, potential provider of solutions. And so I, I'd like to just pose the question, as I did at the start of this, what how central will the role of blockchain be in in connecting these dots, and then specifically on Hyperledger you know, let, let's maybe have a chat. And, and the reason I have, by the way, uh, a photo of Miami on this slide, I'll tell you there's a reason for it. It's not just to cheer everybody up. Um, I'm recalling a conversation we had at an industry event a number of years ago. It was a panel uh, that involved a group of blockchain and DLT specialists. And a few people who, hear, who may hear about this or see this on the recorded version won't be happy for me mentioning this, but I'll do it anyway. Um, this panel was, was about the potential of DLT. It goes back a few years, as I said. And from the back of the room, um, a, a senior member of the trade finance community put his hand up and said, okay, I heard what you said, what you all said, but I, I have one fundamental question. And the fundamental question is why blockchain? 
And the point he was making was actually it's a technical architecture and aren't there other technical architectures that achieve some similar things. And the thing that was striking was that we didn't get a clear answer. Um, and so I, I remain sort of with this question of, you know, what's, what's the new thing? What's the new capability or capacity that's brought to the table by blockchain? And so I'm, I'm happy to have that exchange and conversation and actually be educated as a result of it. Um, and so with that, I think that will be the end of my remarks. I want to thank you all very much for your attention and for uh, sticking with us through this hour. Uh, and Andrea, thank you very much again for the opportunity to come and join you and to share a few thoughts on joining the dots between trade, trade finance and supply chains and all the ESG discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander. It was very insightful and I really enjoyed your speech. Uh, it was great, by the way. It was uh, what I expect you to deliver and it went great, absolutely. Uh, I saw a few raised hands during your speech. To start from uh, my friend Alfonso Borrella. He's still over there. I would love to, to I would love them to, to, to talk, to, to ask questions to you. Alfonso, are you still there? Here I am. Um, thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Really, oh, I, I learned a lot. Okay. You're very kind. Thank you. It, it, it make, made my day and gave me a new direction. Thank you. Thank for you. It. Uh, and thank you, Andrea, for the opportunity to, to talk here. Um, you're quite right in what you're asking, Alexander, uh, quoting your friend from Miami which by the way, wants to be the blockchain hub for Latin America. The new mayor is uh, doing a lot of things to make that city a blockchain hub. Um, the question is, is it, is it the right architecture? And uh, we would like to think that DLT is, but we don't know yet for complete, cert with complete certainty that that is the case, okay? It helps to distribute responsibilities. And in that sense, uh, networking did it before, okay? But it brings in um, this intermediation, which on the other hand is what trade is all about, okay? Both in the intermediaries that at times are needed and the peer-to-peer -peer transactions that that we all wish for, okay. Yeah. But you made me think a lot when you, you made me realize how much of my supply chain supports a slavery, something I never thought of before. So if I could have traceability of that slavery in the things that I buy, I would become a more conscious buyer. So traceability is another of the, of the areas that it could bring, uh, the, 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 the blockchain architecture could be used. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I agree, Alfonso. So, so look, to be clear, I, I'm not critiquing DLT. I understand the potential for it. I, I'm, I'm contrasting it to say, you know, it, it may not be the only solution. It, it's a good complementary solution, or maybe it's a leading edge solution. And maybe it, involve, it evolves to be the leading edge solution. I guess the call I'm, I'm proposing to this audience, because you're all invested in the topic, is that if there were a clear answer to the question, why DLT, it would be very, very compelling to make that part of the story. So to your point about Miami, you know, Panama, I was in Singapore in November. Um, I'm a member of the Bloomberg New Economy Trade, Trade Council, which is a tremendous privilege. And we had an, an, an amazing event uh, in November. Um, and, you know, it, it became very clear that ESG is very central to the trade conversation. Uh, we had one of the ministers from Panama, too, I think, were with us to, to talk about Panama and the onshoring and reshoring discussion and how it could become a center of, of sustainable trade and sustainable activity. They're doing some great things in sustainable tourism. So there were some really, really promising developments in different parts of the world. And I'm glad you highlighted Miami and its role in the DLT space. You know, my, my suggestion to this community is if you could take that why DLT question or why blockchain question and come up with a crisp response, it would be very, very powerful as part of your proposition to the wider, wider world. I agree. I agree with you completely. It's complementary. 
And it's, uh, you said it very well, by the way, Alfonso, when you say disintermediation. And this is what I thought about and wanted to share with you this thought. Uh, I was massively exposed to small and micro companies all over the world in my times uh, when dealing with trade finance in Northern Africa and in South America, where most of the tissue of the economic tissue is represented by those micro companies to grant them with technology that allows peer peer trade and trading. Uh, it's sort of disintermediation and sustainable development. You enable literally those micro uh, companies to trade and not be strangled by the current system. So to me, to have this new technology is some kind of very beneficial. Although we are far from having the definitive, let's say, picture at hand, but in the mid long term, this is something that could perfectly fit sustainable trade and trade finance. Yeah, uh, Andrea, I, I couldn't agree more with you. So, sir, there are a number of interesting fintechs that are targeting now the SME space and the micro enterprise space in terms of financing and enabling them to engage in trade. So, one in particular I'm familiar with called Countable with a K is an American company that does a lot of work across Africa. Um, and they are to the best of my knowledge, a, a, a blockchain based architecture, and, and they're targeting exactly the sorts of scenarios that you're describing. Um, now, one of the other things, uh, I'm a member of something called the World Trade Board, and um, we um, have published very recently a paper that tries to take a slightly different angle on the SME question. So typically, and, and in every conversation I've ever been in on SMEs, it's been a very patronizing discussion that says, oh, the poor SME, they're having such a hard time, they can't access finance, they don't have resources, they, they don't know how to manage supply, all of this stuff, right? The whole litany of, of list of things they can't do. But we said, look, hang on a minute. If anybody's ever run an SME, you know that the people who, who found and run small businesses are very tough. They're very resilient, they're very creative. They survive all kinds of crises. They negotiate their way through all kinds of things. So why don't we change the conversation and talk about the SME as an empowered entity instead of as a victim in the conversation? And so that's the gist of our paper. Uh, which we're just, we, uh, as I said, we just published it maybe a week or so ago. And so we'll be starting to do some work and some advocacy around the SME as an empowered entity. Part of the conversation being technology, how it enables the SME to engage, how it reduces the cost of you know, due diligence, onboarding, all the kinds of things that we know are problematic for traditional financiers to deal with SMEs, but also that will help the emerging fintechs and alternative solutions. So I think there's as much as we could have a you know, evolving discussion on tech architecture, we can have an evolving discussion on SMEs, just like we had today, an evolving discussion on supply chains and trade and what is involved in all of that. And we can put all of that under a sustainability and ESG umbrella. So I, I genuinely think that this is not an option. I think the urgency is huge uh, around ESG and sustainability. And I think you'll see more and more drive from not only the capital markets but the regulatory authorities to make this central to our conversation. And, and if you're if you're on a board or if you're in a C-suite and you're not talking any ESG or sustainability, you are making a huge mistake and it's going to cost you. Well said, Alexander. Uh, Andre, could I speak a bit? Of course, sir. Alexander, so, well, first of all, I, I want to compliment you for the reality check that you brought to most of us, like Alfonso said at a personal level, about the kind of impact or a kind of non-ESG impact that we're having on our consumption today. That's really, really a wake up call for me, uh, for probably everybody else. But I also want to compl compliment you for bringing out the complexity that BCG diagram that you brought up. Is something which I've not seen for a while, but actually it's a waking, waking up call to a lot of people who are trying to solve the digitization thing. But most of all, the last part, when you mentioned about do not look at SMEs as victims, look at them as empowered things. But I love that part, right? I really want to read the paper. I've not looked for it, but I will search for it after this call. I'll read it. 
Uh, but I'm happy, sorry, happy, ha happy, happy to send you a copy. It's been, it's, I think it's been posted on LinkedIn, but anyways, I'm happy to share a copy. I'll, I'll share it, Andrea, with you. So if you want to distribute it to the group and I'll send you a copy as well. So please do, please do. I will, uh, I will share it with the rest of the team. Thanks. Also on the, on the Happy Life to Trade Finance Day. Hey, just sort of finish uh, what I was going to say. Uh, not so much of a question, given that we don't have a time. Um, whether it is DLT or whatever technology, but the most important part is helping these empowered SMEs to be able to get to the financing to do the job in a responsible way. I believe that they are resilient and they actually want to do the right thing. They are not just going after money like part of my statement, some of those big corporates. Corporates are more greedy than SMEs. SMEs are just making the ends meet. And they want to do the right thing. And we have to fix that technology gap in getting the traceability to make sure that all the big financing institutions and the small financing institutions can finance the sustainable produce, sustainable trade in a sustainable way. I think we all have a responsibility and with the kind of conversation that you kind of speech you gave, I'm sure we can do it together. So Brett, thank you for that. And let me pick up on two points and, and I'll start with your last point on the SMEs versus the large corporates. It's interesting you say that. I was, I just saw the, and I don't know his exact title, but it's something like head of, head of VSG or head of sustainability, whatever. Oh no, I'm sorry, it was worse. It, it's worse, it's head of compliance. Um, and this guy was talking about a, a large company that got caught up in some very significant fraudulent activity. Um, and he said with a straight face, which almost made me fall out of my chair, he said, corporations don't commit crimes, people commit crimes. Now, this organization, you know, it, was, it wasn't an isolated incident. It was a systemic issue within the company. And this guy, instead of owning it and saying, okay, look, we need to fix it. We made some mistakes, whatever it was, right? And he, would, he had been brought in from the outside to fix the problem. Instead of owning it, he said, oh, no, no, corporations don't commit crimes. It's like a few individuals in the shop that do that. So, so when you have those kinds of attitudes, it perpetuates the sort of perception that you, that you described. On the DLT thing, on the, pardon me, on the BCG analysis, um, it's amazing uh, for those who've never been in a trade finance operations business, and I, I have been in more years ago than I can care to count or, or than I will admit publicly. Um, I, I remember speaking to one of the deputies at one of the probably top three trade processing banks in the world. And he said, oh yeah, he said, I always get these 20 somethings knocking on my door saying, I'm gonna come in and fix your problem. I'm gonna digitize your entire business. And he says, the first thing I asked them is, have you ever seen what a trade pro processing shop looks like? And the, the kid will say, no, I've, I've never been in. I just, I understand it theoretically. I understand the paper flow, all of this. He said, okay, stop talking, come with me. And so he takes them to this like huge processing shop with like a thousand people sitting there moving paper. And you know, the, the guy who's the CEO of this FinTech looks around and goes, oh my God, this is more complicated than I thought. Well, all right, now let's have a conversation. <laughs> So, so again, I take your point. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's worth, it's, it's a graphic that really brings to focus how complicated the, 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 the realities are on the ground, right? Uh, Alexander, sorry for interrupting you. I think we've come to an end. This is the end of the speech. I'm so sorry, I would love to go on with this discussion over and over again. It's a topic that is centered at the core of my own interest. And maybe we can, can expand our chat in the future. I uh, thank you it's so much. It's, it was a real pleasure to have you today, and hopefully we can expand our discussions in the future to see how DLTs and especially open source ones can fit ESGs, the current and the future ESG scenario. Thank you so much, Alexander, for joining us today. Looking forward to talking to you again, and have a great day, you all. Come today, we go to join forces again in two weeks' time. Stay all safe and healthy. Talk soon again. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Be safe. Alexander. Bye, Subra. Thank you so much. Bye. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, Alexander. Bye. Great. Bye. Great. Great. Thank you.